Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me. My name is Liz Faust. Today, we're talking with the lovely Eric Antonio Benitez um, for his artist talk for Catalyst Contemporaries for the current exhibition, Authentic Realities, which has been extended through the summer of 2020 until the fall. Okay, Eric, how are Hello. you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? Doing pretty good. Okay, so first off, um, talk introduce yourself a little bit and talk briefly about kind of your work, your work in the show, um, and then we'll jump into the questions. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm a multiple disciplinary artist and uh, my work expands from studio work to uh, projects and research. And over the years, a lot of it has been site specific in relation to um, things in the, of, of like ecology and um, social practices and just like an investigation and experimentation of mediums as well and creating immersive environments to working with uh, sound and video uh, along with painting, sculpture and then uh, installation. Um, yeah, I think, I don't know, if, is there anything else you want me to say? No, that's perfect. Um, and what about your pieces in the show? Oh, right. Um, so the work in the show is actually some new uh, body of work that I had started about two years ago. And it's kind of based around using the material of camouflage. Um, so I, I recently, and in, in relation to uh, a recent trip that I did in the Amazon in Peru, the work sort of has a connection. Um, and so the work is kind of like investigating like textiles through this very tactile use, but also um, creating in a way like rituals of the work and also referencing the history of the textile in relation to uh, camouflage being something that comes from nature and how it's been appropriated and reused as a pattern throughout history from like, um, from like war to fashion to hunting and um, and then also just thinking about how that material relates to the history of textiles in Latin America and drawing the connection between those two things in addition to nature and and what what the relationship of textile is to nature in a way so the the pieces are exploring that and in a way like they're also kind of manifest in, in various points of, of how to um, perceive the work. Mm -hmm. For example, um, like in a way, when I first started these pieces, I was thinking about conceptually making landscapes that, um, so the camouflage is sort of symbolic of, in a way, like a, um, a militarized landscape. And then it's contrasted with imagery of, textiles and symbols from like traditional Latin American practices. And that's sort of in a way creating a reference to a like the history of landscape painting, but also uh, the, the political and narrative history of these geographical locations that are always in a lot of turmoil with, with like war and, and violence and whatnot. And yeah. Perfect. Okay. So First question, you've talked about war and landscapes. How does healing fit into your practice? Um, I think it, it, it's in a way, it fits into my practice as a, like a mechanism of coping and processing. Um, so it, in a way, you know, dealing with like these, with like these world, day-to-day -day news or experiences um, or like histories that we are a part of, they sort of, it's like in a way to deal, like making the work is a way to heal mm -hmm. from these traumas in a way. Um, so like kind of going back to the original piece that I had started, it was, it was originally referencing um, a textile that, that I own that's from my, my, my family's homeland, El Salvador. And uh, part of where that thought came from, I guess, was from 
a healing aspect where it's kind of facing that reality mm -hmm. and, and, and reinterpreting it and dissecting it, but also creating this approach that's, that's very traditional of, of like craft work, you know, creating this, this in a way like a modern day textile from, from my point of view at least. And cr creating that, I feel like, is a way also of healing. Mm -hmm. And it, and I think it, in, in, it also falls into the history of textile as, mm -hmm. as the act of making textile, I believe, is, is an act of healing in itself. And then in relation to my other work, um, I think making space for others to reflect deals with healing when it comes to my like, immersive installation projects. Um, and also the act of creating the work and going to these spaces, uh, maybe outside of my studio and like creating performances and rituals is also another aspect of healing that, that mm -hmm. happens in my work. Um, so you're talking about how the inspiration specifically for these works is textiles, these 2D works. Um, how do you decide which work becomes 2D and which work becomes 3D and beyond into installations? That's a good question. <laughs> um, it's for me, it's very organic and fluid. There's so in the way my, my process is initiated is, is very, um, it's always kind of improvised. And, but within that improvisational act, there's a lot of intentionality. Mm -hmm. So usually it's, it's very timely on how I decide those, whether something's gonna be this or that. So if like, for instance, I wanna create something that's more of like a subtle meditation or reflective, um, experience for someone or a way to connect with an audience usually those works are going to always be at a smaller scale usually two or three dimensional um, or two dimensional excuse me and then but once I start working with I believe objects that are organic or artificial and they're they have more of a, a mass quality I usually approach it in a, in a three-dimensional um, approach. And it, it, really, it really depends um, because certain materials or, or, or visual cues have different triggers for me and on how I, I decide to work with the material. Um, and I can, I can show some of the pieces to give you some, some examples. That'd be great. All right, so here um, I'll start with this. So this this piece, um, you can see it, right? Not yet. Oh, one second. All there right. we go. Cool. So yeah, this this work, um, which is one of the last pieces that I finalized for this for the show at catalyst um in a way i think the material was sort of in at the beginning stage was very challenging for me and so i sort of sat with it and just it was also like a material that I had found um from from like some scraps of a cnc machine and I, I, I just knew by the nature of the quality of the material that I wanted to activate every side of it. And that's kind of where first I knew it was gonna be a sculpture, but I also am in, throughout like a lot of the timeline of the work that I do, there's always a relationship between, this, between sculpture and painting and how it reflects and being able to create this ambiguous medium in a way by distorting it to either reflect both sides or contrast um, and in this case it also has photography so it also has another two-dimensional um, aspect to it so th in this work it sort of that's how this piece manifested it in itself was by just sitting with the material and kind of just allowing 
allowing like the reflecting on it and and this and like the use of material to just decide it's a sculpture um but at the same time it i think that act of wanting to create a ritual or in like an offering is also another another influence in how it became more of a three-dimensional object versus um this piece which was taken from multiple photographs references that I took while I was in uh, the region of Loreto in um, the Amazon rainforest of Peru. And so there, there's, even though it's a flat image, there's a lot of dimension. If you start seeing like the shadows and then uh, the play with lights, light and space. And um, so in a sense, you know, there, there's this urge of, of wanting to have something that's three dimensional, but it's in this sort of flat way. And I'm, and I'm interested on how like photography translates three dimensionality and in a way that that's sort of what initially inspired this piece. And, and then also wanting to create this um, play with the, the physical and digital uh, perspective. And so like over here, there's this, zoom in um so you see there's this leaf which is actually um taken from another painting that i did using camouflage and so create bringing something that's physical into a a digital kind of realm um, mm -hmm. while including elements of of uh these visuals that do come from like these landscapes but then also distorting them so they also are digitized and manipulated in a different way where it's not even just, uh, for me, they're not sh a straightforward photograph. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then also playing with text, um, which these, all these numbers are based on um, a satellite reading of all the, the illegal uh, cutting of wood that's going on in the Amazon daily and so this was from the last time I checked and I have a bunch of overlaid numbers as a, as a metaphor of how like information is distorted and how we we are overloaded with information sometimes that it just kind of becomes a blurb mm -hmm. and it loses its its significance um, and then overall the piece is is uh, in a way like a a sigil, kind of like a coded language that I'm recreating and reimagining for myself and reference to the history of hieroglyphs and the history of, of uh, native languages and just how, in, in a way, language could be obscured from a certain perspective mm -hmm. and a certain viewer and creator and whatnot. Um, yeah, I'll zoom back in. How do I? Oh, okay. I'm back. Awesome. Uh, so, a lot of your work, especially your sculpture work, include repurposed items. Um, how did this evolve in your practice? Um, I think part of it was there, I, there's there's two parts actually. Uh, one being the urge to want to work with sculpture and three-dimensional objects but not having formal training or um, experience and two being um, out of practicality and in the sense of when I first started using more like uh, three-dimensional repurposed objects it was because I was happened to be living in a space that was next to a loading dock where people were dropping off lots of materials that to me were uncommon because um, cause it's, a, it, it, it's interesting because you know everybody has a certain aesthetic on what they collect what they have what they let go of and in that there's a lot of mo like beneficial moments because you're it's a way to like engage with an object that is in a way un unbiased to you because you don't it's not your object, you didn't buy it, it's, you know, but you're choosing to interact with it and reinvent its, its purpose. 
And to me, that was um, it's a very interesting way of creating. And, and also, I think it opened up a lot of ideas and doors for me. And eventually, it led me into doing installation work. And now, uh, being able to become more familiar with sculpting and, and uh, learning how to, how to manipulate or how to create a three-dimensional object. Awesome. Could you talk about briefly your um, other mediums and practices, such as your collaboration, music, and tutorial work, and how they inform each other? Sure. Um, yeah. So I've been I I do a little bit of public work, um, which also falls into collaboration. And to me, uh, I've always appreciated collaboration because it's a way to get out of my own personal comfort zone and also learn um, from the other artists, either from like etiquette to, to uh, medium to skills and, and also like the sharing of skill knowledge. And I, and I always think that when there's a collective or collaborative approach to creating, I think it has more of an impact um, and has more potential because, you know, like the saying, one mind is better, two minds is better than one mind. Um, I, I really, uh, that sentiment really like resonates with me and, um, yeah. And then also outside of, so I've done a couple collaborations and usually, um, another thing I forgot to mention is that a lot of the collaborative work I do is with artists who are, are working in a very different way than I do, or have a focus in something else that I'm not as familiar with. And so I've worked with um, Sutton Denlong, who's a woodworker, and then um, for a Light City collaboration where we basically um, created, it was inspired by um, like the idea of playgrounds and what it means to be um, an adult, but also like wanting that longing to want to tap back into your, your childhood kind of energy and whatnot. And so there's an emphasis of like creating these works that were playful in, in remnants and nostalgia of a playground, but also um, there's a, a, an approach to working with nature, which is something that for me always, I'd always come back to in terms of uh, how I create my visual language. And and so like a lot of the works was dealing uh, with uh, plants that, that are important to us, whether they be plants that we use in cooking a lot or plants that are in our homes, plants that are from our, our, our uh, origin backgrounds, um, native to those countries, plants that are medicinal and just, just kind of in a way um, honoring and remembering our important and significant uh, relationship that we have with nature and and then um and in that work there's also some um use of technology with with like leds arduinos and sound and and going into sound that's like another um thing that i also work with and so with sound um i'm very interested in like field recordings to djing to sound art and the relationship between all those and um just in general like the the investigation and scientific approach of of what sound holds um in terms of how like being able to investigate and study how vibrations and frequencies affect the world we we coexist in mm -hmm. and which is part of the drive that also led into me going into these different landscapes uh, for doing research, like um, going back to the last one that I did, which was in the Amazon, like being able to explore um, the ecosystem through a sonic perspective, not just visual, um, and take into account um, the significance of it and, and like being able to approach it by recording it from underwater to the different field and landscapes um, and then how that those recordings can translate into another work and and that goes from sampling maybe a part of uh, the region that I visited for a song to 
just actually creating a meditative piece to have a viewer transcend into that space um, through, through, through listening. And, um, and in a way, like uh, sound plays like a really big uh, role in my life as, as, um, as a way of like learning and, and coexisting. And uh, in a way, like um, it becomes a meditative practice. And, and then that's where I start kind of getting into the research of like all, all, um, Pauline Oliveros who works a lot with, with um, the idea of listening versus hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and then so, but, but to me, um, working with all these mediums, in a way, kind of inform each other. And it gives me, it's like almost like a collaborative effort, um, in a way, kind of what I, what I said earlier, like it's, I, I feel like by understanding various mediums, I, I get to learn and rethink about something of another medium in a whole different way, even if those two mediums aren't being used together. But it really, it really gives me um, different perspectives to approach other mediums and how they reflect onto each other. And, and like lots of ways I think about painting as like a scene from a video or, or a moment or an abstraction of a video versus, um, I think about video as a painting that's moving and photography as well. And, and, um, and I think there's just, there's such, such a relationship with a, a lot of mediums. And to me, that's like a very exciting way to work. Mm -hmm. it, it really keeps me engaged and always uh, informs different ways of how I think about every concept or narrative or theme that I'm working with in relation to the medium. And, and that also is, is, is relative to like curation, which is um, something I've been doing for, let's say the past five years. Mm -hmm. um, and um, to me, curation, I guess, started as a way of community building and being able to support people around me as well and encourage, um, kind of like encourage, uh, sort of different relationships with people um so and, and like for me as like coming from a, a curator perspective something that is very important for me is being able to build new relationships with different artists artists that i think normally wouldn't show together but their work has a relation or or just putting different artists together that could bring a different community and bring it trying to merge those because mm -hmm. um, I think a lot with like since art is so expansive and evolved uh, at this point in time um, there's a lot of different niches and different communities that exist and sometimes you know that's that's okay I mean it's it's the nature of it mm -hmm. but I think it's also important to cultivate a connection uh, with different communities and, and movements of art. And so that's something that um, that's really important to me. And within that, it's also um, a way for me to step out of my own way of looking at art and seeing how other people around me that are in the same circles, age groups, or, or just working in the same mediums, or it doesn't even have to be the age, same age group, but um, how they're interacting with the work I think for me is very informative and it gives me a new lens so in a way it's also kind of a collaborative effort yeah. um, and, it, and it's a way to engage with art outside of my own self in a way um, and I, I think that's it's always important to you know level yourself a little bit <laughs> I understand that <laughs> yeah. um, okay so a few more questions um, this is something we asked all the artists of Authentic Realities is how do you see your work and your practice fitting in with the other two newly represented artists by Catalyst, uh, Sobia Ahmed and Damon Arhouse? How do you feel that you fit in with them and your work fits with them or not? Mm -hmm. I think, um, in a way, by nature of, of uh, how we're all, I think we all differentiate in terms of our choice of medium. 
and um but I think there's a relationship where we are sort of creating our own language. Um, and a lot of that creation of this language is coming from a very personal place, I think, for all of us, which I think um, I, I see that's where I see the, the big connection where we're, we're reimagining and revisualizing um, ourselves into this 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 language that is is in a way giving space um and and uh, a place for for people to reflect and heal that can relate to that same um narrative so in a way i think there's there's a there's a relationship there um and in a way i think uh by the nature of the medium, there is more of a connection with my work, I think with, well, I, there is some paintings in that work, but I think most of it is, is when you zoom out, you see most of my work as textile work. Mm -hmm. At least I think so. <laughs> um, and I think thinking about that, it relates a lot to what Sobia's work is, is doing and kind of thinking about landscape. I think landscape is sort of a, a big connection with our work, but the approach is very different. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, the choice of material is is uh, also, I think, a, a way that's kind of different, but but still, um, I think there's more of a soft quality in Sobia's work. Like it's 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 not like in a in a bad way, but like just. There's more, I guess, or it's organic, I think, more. She's letting the material kind of just hover in this way that is um, you would normally, how you would normally approach it versus um, I think a lot of the material I'm using with textile, I'm reinventing its functionality mm -hmm. and um, kind of having more of a physical manipulation where it's like either stretch or um, being being um, glued onto something. So it's, it's almost like archiving it, I think. Um, and um, so yeah, that's kind of kind of where I see the, the similarities. And also, I think there's a, a very ritualistic um, connection between how I'm using my my body of work and how Sylvia is also using her work. Uh, but I also can connect to, to Damon um, in the sense of there's painting elements, um, though the, the work in that show is not as figurative as his. Um, I still I see a, a sense of uh, color playing a, a connection and, and, um, and sort of just this painterly aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Okay, so the final question. Um, so we are currently experiencing COVID-19 and, and the shutdowns. Um, mm -hmm. How has this pandemic and this time and this kind of societal shift uh, um, affected your practice or, and or um, inspired new work? Or even change work that you were working on? Well, hmm. yeah, it's, I, I, it's, it's a very like day to day thing for me with this um, situation. I think every week my thoughts and <laughs> perspectives are, are drastically changing. I think um, it's becoming a little bit more subtle now. Uh, just because we're we're now in a different kind of routine, mm -hmm. uh, but we're still in a routine, so it's in a way comforting. <laughs> yeah. But um, you know, I think trailing back to a like the the circumstance of of this like pandemic coming from um, as a result of 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 us not taking care of, of our ecological home 
as a result, you know, we're dealing with this situation. And, and um, to me, that's just more affirming that, that I have to keep doing the work that I'm doing. Not like have to as in like a drag, but have to that in a necessity. Mm -hmm. um, because I think um, that's like, the, for me, that's the way, there's, that's how I see the future being able to exist is by us changing the way we deal and coexist with our planet. Um, and, and then, so to me that just in a way has inspired more relevance of, of continuing this, this body of, of different bodies of work that, that are working with ecology um, to keep in a way um, advocating its significance and reminding people and and I think you know educating people too because I always say that education is is probably like one of the things that is going to save us in the future and it's 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 such an important thing because it can drastically change your life from something small to you know giving you tools and for an abundant way of living mm -hmm. so um in a way, I it's definitely has become more of an, a necessity to want to to work with that those concepts, um, and at the same time, you know, um, thinking it from the social aspect, you get to see a lot. We got I think this this experience has really taught us a lot, mm -hmm. has shown us a lot of the weak points in our societies and and it's it's like really frustrating because um i personally feel like i got slapped in the face um you know not not because i'm an artist and i'm dealing with any economical stress but more in the sense of how our government and other governments are reacting to the situation and how they're capitalizing from the situation. Mm -hmm. And it just really, really demonstrates that we can't really count on these bigger forces to take care of us and, and, and lead us. Like there's lack of leadership and, and lack of, of responsibility. Mm -hmm. So that is a, another thing that um, it's really it's, it's in it's in my thoughts a lot and and you know what how do we move forward is questions that I've been asking myself and also asking myself how the work that I make can help you know that spark either thought or action um, so I'm sure I, I don't have like a specific thing that I want to do in terms of, you know, responding to all these situations. Uh, but I know that they're going to, they're, they're, they're going to ripple eventually into work that I create after, after this. And, um, and in a way, um, looking at it from a positive point of view, this situation is also, made me realize my relationship with time mm -hmm. and and how i'm i'm realizing more and more that i think we're we're moving too fast as a as a society which is kind of damaging because i think from from a more intimate level we forget our our necessities and our our priorities um like self-care and um our relationship with nature i think something positive to think about is how a lot of people are really you know retrieving back to nature because we don't have all these other things that we normally get to do like go to the restaurant or go to the gym or um have these gatherings and so i think a lot of people are are rekindling their connection with nature or are building a new relationship with nature and in a way having like um, an awakening moment of themselves as at least I feel that way and, and I, I'm having those experiences. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, and and I think the that that has just revealed so much to me. Um, it 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 has shown that you know in a way the way society moves with with the time and 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 like labor of work is not really conducive to our natural way of living and and um so i'm th i'm thinking about those ideas and how to also explore that in in art and and um you know being able to thinking about also thinking more about work that can be collaborative to the public mm -hmm. not just with other artists but creating and thinking like of different ways how to engage an audience and a public in a way that can bring them into that kind of reflection of themselves and and like providing grounding and providing um information and education that is that is very important and to their health or well-being and um and, and then also for me it's it's been kind of a positive experience because uh like i've been super like back to back with projects and shows which i'm happy and, and, and feel fortunate about but at the same time um it's making me realize that maybe that's not really the way to be an effective artist mm -hmm. because a like you 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 end up burning out way more and crashing and lack of sleep and you know your health takes a toll um but also like for instance now like i've been able to have all this studio time without any pressure of exhibitions and whatnot and and i've been feeling very productive in the beginning it was it was it was a little tough you know because i was processing everything that was happening and everybody's the fear and stuff but um now that I've got to like settle in a little bit. Um, I've been probably the most productive I've ever been because A, I have the luxury of being able to really contemplate what I'm making. And at the same time, it's given me the opportunity to, to reflect on the previous bodies of work. Mm -hmm. And and like, you know, I, I like this improvised approach that I that I have in my work, but I also require a lot of thinking as mm -hmm. in as a balance. And I think now, like, I'm thinking about my work way differently because I have the time to decompress everything. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that's been a, a positive positive note for me. So there's there's a lot there's a lot to to say on this matter, but I think on on the on the summary thesis level. <laughs> That's 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 what I have to say about that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So uh, that concludes our talk. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, the artist talk with Eric Antonio Benitez for Careless Contemporaries Authentic Reality.